Good morning, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for being part of WorkSite's webinar, Leading the Way, Industry Innovating Mental Health in the Workplace. Hello, my name is Rob Kelly. I'm the Director of Special Service at WorkSafe, and I'll be your host for the webinar today. Now, while our program sessions this year are virtual, our, our aim is still the same for Health and Safety Month, and that's to keep you up to date. And the focus this year for all of us is navigating through COVID-19. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers, but before we do, we have three speakers, uh, industry leaders in their field. First off, we have Meryl Stibbard, who is the program manager from WorkWell within WorkSafe. Good morning, Meryl. Hello, we also have, we have Dr. Sarah Cotton, who is a registered and endorsed occupational, sorry, organizational psychologist and co-director of Transitioning Well. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Rob. Great to and be part of the conversation this morning. Thank you. And finally, we have Danielle Moss, who is Project Manager for Thriving in Health from Peninsula Health. Good morning, Danielle. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So we've structured the conversation today as a, more of a conversational style between myself and our three speakers who are all working to deliver uh, innovative solutions in mental health promotion, prevention and assisting employers identify and respond to mental health risks in the workplace. So with that, we'll uh, get into it. So, uh, Meryl, I'm actually going to lead off with yourself, so I'll give you a bit of a heads up, it's no surprise. Mm -hmm. Can you help, I suppose, start, start by helping the audience understand the current landscape? One of, one of the things is mental health uh, injuries are, are increasing uh, across every workplace. What is it that WorkSafe is doing in the prevention space to reduce harm to Victorian workers? Yeah, thanks, Rob. And you're absolutely right. Rates of mental injury are increasing. In fact, in 2019, we saw that 14% of new claims submitted to work, WorkSafe were related to mental injury. And unfortunately, we expect this to grow in the next 10 years to over 33%. These are some alarming numbers, and that's why prevention of mental injury is a key priority for WorkSafe. And at the heart of our prevention strategy is the five-year, $50 million WorkWell program, and that's being delivered in partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services. And WorkWell is a multifaceted primary prevention program, and we're working with unions, peak bodies, employer and industry experts to support businesses to create safe and mentally healthy working environments so that their employees can thrive at work. One of our program streams is a platform called the WorkWell Toolkit, and already almost 8,000 businesses have now registered to use the free online toolkit. Inside the toolkit, you'll find practical tools and information to help support mentally healthy workplaces. Another one of our program streams is the WorkWell Mental Health Improvement Fund, and this fund provides large-scale investment to pilot programs that are aiming to prevent mental injury and promote positive mental health in Victorian workplaces. Currently, there are 25 projects funded through the Mental Health Improvement Fund, and they're working across a range of different industries. These projects are piloting new initiatives and they're conducting research. And this is all to lead to working to build the evidence base for best practice in managing workplace mental health. And Sarah and Danielle, who are joining me on the panel today, represent two of those 25 projects and the fund's common focus on the work-related factors. Something struck me there. We, we, at the very introduction, I spoke about what we're doing, innovative ways to deal with mental health prevention. And when you said there about the current claims last year, I think you said, was, was it 14% expected to grow up to 33% in 10 years? That's right. That's, 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 right. that's I suppose, in many ways, that's the, the idea of the prevention is preventing that from happening. And Absolutely. teasing out a little bit more, you mentioned there about work-related factors. Um, mm -hmm. You may know what that means. I may know what that means. But from an audience's point of view, can you explain us a little bit more about what work-related factors means? Yeah, absolutely, Rob, and, and this is something that's really important when you're thinking about workplace mental health, things like workplace relationships, job demands, and remote and isolated work, which has become an even bigger focus for many organisations moving to remote work this year. Management of the work-related factors are within the control of employers and business leaders, so they're a good place to start focusing when you're thinking about improving workplace mental health. When the work-related factors are designed and managed well, they can have a really positive impact on mental health in the workplace. And this has a flow-on effect to improving workplace culture and increasing productivity, but most importantly, in preventing mental injury. 
And if the work-related factors aren't managed well, they can become psychosocial hazards. And what this means is there's an increased risk of work-related stress, and that can lead to physical injury, mental injury, or even both at the same time. And the work-related factors are a key theme in workplace mental health and a common focus for the projects that are supported by the fund. You've covered off on a lot of points there, both in your first question and the second question. So what I'd like to do next is, is bring Sarah and Danielle in. To, let's get into this a little bit deeper. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead off with yourself first, Sarah. Um, at the heart of the work uh, that you do and the focus on what you do is on working parents. What are the unique mental health challenges they're currently facing? Sure, it's a great question, Rob. And through the Perinatal Workplace Well Program, the program that we're working on, uh, we've been working with various businesses across the retail and con construction industries. And I guess probably some of the key challenges that have really been highlighted for us in COVID, Rob, the first one has been work-family conflict. And I'm sure that won't come as a surprise for any of the listeners listening in today. I think even with the easing of restrictions, there's, you know, a, a number of demands that, you know, working parents are having to navigate. Um, I was reminded this week, Rob, I had a son who came down with a sore throat and I was just reminded of he had to get a COVID test and, you know, had two days off school. So, you know, many parents are still having to navigate, you know, sick days in a new world and also, you know, getting their kids up to speed educationally. Um, and just with school holidays around the corner with Christmas, you know, with many of us working from home, there's still, you know, very real challenges that, that working parents have as they integrate work and life at this time. And I guess the second one, Rob, would be picking up what, on what Merrill's just sort of really highlighted around the work-related factors is that remote and isolated work. I think, you know, with many of us working from home since about sort of March, which is about seven months now, can you believe it? Um, we know mm -hmm. that one of the greatest challenges of remote work is, you know, that sense of isolation. And working parents have really um, experienced that really in a really raw way, Rob, with many not having the same level of supports that they would normally have particularly, you know, new parents, where they haven't often even been able to introduce their new babies to their family. So it's been a, a really challenging time for many working parents at this time. So can I just go back a second? You mentioned the project that you were on about perinatal. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain what that is? Sure. Um, perinatal is a term that's defined from the time of conception through to the time that that child's one. So that's sort of the very clinical definition, Rob. So from the time that that baby's conceived right through to the time that that child turns one is termed that sort of that perinatal period. Because what I'm, where I was going with that is what I'm hearing there is we're talking about workplaces. I heard you talk about navigation. You mentioned teenager, but it's also reflective of, of that particular workforce area that's in there and the risks that they face and the challenge of, as you said, navigating and going between work and home and the challenges that are in there. So thank you very much, so much for that. Which Yeah, no worries. Rob. Which leads in, Danielle, I'm going to lead into yourself now, is that you're working on a collaborative project for frontline health workers uh, in hospitals. Uh, and subject matter experts to to create a change at either broad organizational or system level and right now with the amount of change that's going on in health what role and that's driven by COVID what role is COVID-19 having on your project work yeah thanks Rob um you're right we are doing a collaborative project between a number of health services and some subject matter experts and just to give you a bit of context about that the broader project actually includes four um, smaller projects and two of those we're working with the Black Dog Institute. So looking at some education for our people leaders. We're also looking at formal research with Associate Professor Samuel Harvey that's looking at job control in the workplace. We're also looking um, to develop a, a framework or a response for, for health services looking at critical incidents and that's a, a piece of work we're doing with FBG Group. Um, and we're also taking a, a unique approach to a sensorial design um, project with Dr Oli Kotsaftis who's a, a lecturer at RMIT. In terms of COVID, it certainly has given us an impetus to really understand the systems that we have in place and what we need to do in regards to getting those right so that our workforce can thrive. Um, obviously, from a project perspective, we always think about uh, perhaps having hiccups on the way, but I guess the pandemic was certainly not one of those um, that we did think of. We need to be resourceful, we need to be adaptive, and we also need to be obviously resilient. But importantly, you know, given the changes in landscape, and Sarah's mentioned that in terms of working from home and also in terms of perhaps people working in different areas, we need to make sure that the work we do going forward is really appropriate to those um, settings as well. I suppose the challenge here is you're, you're working in the health space. So you actually, guys, I understand you work in a hospital. Um, 
what sort of mental injuries uh, are you seeing in the clinical front line? That's a, a really good one, Rob. Certainly COVID is, we can still understand it as, as new and evolving for us. And there's a lot of research coming out globally and there's some work also coming across locally. Um, lessons that we're seeing from around the world that we are actually seeing increased collaboration on work sites. We're seeing uh, pride in the work that's being done through our sector. You know, some people are doing some incredible things. And also we're seeing more open conversation about mental health um, with people asking for and reaching out for help. But like other disasters, what we do know is we expect to see stress and anxiety, so an increased levels of this. Um, problems with sleep, so sleep disturbance for some people. Fatigue, and in the health sector particularly, we may see moral distress or moral injury. And certainly um, physical and mental burnout is something that we're seeing um, again as well. So I guess as a consequence of COVID, we've had to really make sure that the immediacy of the support needs of the, of the sector uh, have been identified and that we're developing robust plans and at the organisational level, you know, that's certainly happening. And there is a lot of work through, you know, WorkSafe, the WorkWell program uh, through Safer Care, where there is wellbeing support um, also developed. Um, the volatility of COVID though, again, means the adaptability um, in providing safe, you know, psychologically safe workplaces will need to be there. It's interesting. I, I picked up on a point that you spoke about. Uh, it's being talked about more, and people are reaching out more. And, and you, know, you spoke about burnout and stress and so on. Mm. That's that's quite encouraging to sound that we're talking about it more as a conversation. How how are those conversations occurring? I think you find that they happen um, at the peer level, but I think too they are happening more broadly um, in an organisation level where people are discussing openly. You know what's happening for them, and I think you know it's a really important piece because. The more the conversation happens, the you know the the more it becomes part of the business of the organisation, and I think it's really important that people feel comfortable to be able to to name it and to talk about it and to feel safe doing that. Yeah, thanks for that. And Sarah, back to yourself on this question. So the the work you're doing is is supporting you know parents through the perinatal uh, workplace wellbeing program. It sounds sounds really really good. And I'm assuming lots of parents are actually watching today. What can you offer as some practical and effective ways to stay mentally well for both not not just work but also for personally um, and how to support them yeah great it's such an important question rob isn't it i think with the blurring of work and life for many working parents at the moment it's so important that um, you know we're more intentional about how we sort of set up some boundaries between work and life you know there's always going to be demands isn't there there's always going to be deliverables and it's so important that working parents uh, really intentionally think about how they're going to separate work and life Rob almost some of the ways I like to think about that is for working parents to be really clear about what their sort of non-negotiables are if you like you know it's so important Rob that we have that time where we can detach from work and I think working at home for many has made that quite difficult. Um, I think leading on from that and picking up on some of the points that Danielle talked about as well, just not just with working parents, but more generally, is the need to actually put some fuel in our own tanks. You know, I think we've all been really busy, haven't we, through COVID. Um, and I always say, Rob, you know, you we don't expect our mobile phones to not be charged at the end of the day. And yet sometimes we expect ourselves to keep going without actually putting any fuel in our tanks. And it's so important that we actually take time to to refuel. I think Rob, um, Libby Tricker, I think probably said it best, the famous Australia swimmer. She, after the birth of her first child, she suffered terribly from perinatal mental health. And she said this comment that always stayed with me. She said, you know, we can't pour for an empty cups. And it's so true, isn't it? You know, particularly at this time. And for those listening in that have been supporting, I would imagine many workplaces at this time, I think that message is so true for all of us, isn't it? Just to make sure that we're actually stopping um, and, and refueling at, at this time, Rob. Really stood out for me a bit there, about saying, you know, recharging your phone, putting it down, recharging, so it's ready for you the next day. Uh, and, and Libby's comment there as well, uh, pouring for an empty glass. That kind of struck me from the point of view, you spoke about boundaries and we've spoken about mental health and trying to get the boundary of work and home. How do I recharge? If I'm going all of the time and this, I'm feeling the pressure potentially, um, how, do I, how do I recharge? 
Well, I think it's going to be different for all of us, Rob. What, re what recharges me will might be different to what recharges you. But I think what the important thing is that you've got to actually take time to get out of automatic pilot and to find those things that do recharge you. And often it's about getting back to basics, Rob. You know, am I stopping to have lunch? You know, so many people working from home at the moment haven't even been stopping to have lunch or to make sure that they're having, you know, drinking water or even having, you know, a five minute or a 10 minute break between meetings. So many people have just been going from meeting to meeting to meeting with no buffer time. So it's not rocket science, Rob. Often it's just those little things that can make a massive difference to, you know, to actually protecting our well-being, you know, at this time. But I'm wondering, Rob, if I could also just add in a couple of tips for workplaces as well, because I think I'm conscious we've Very talked true, yeah. at that individual level, but I think it's so important, isn't it, that workplaces understand that there's so much that they can be doing to help mitigate some of those, I guess, work related factors that Meryl's talked about. Um, so really, you know, understanding what's causing those work-life conflicts for their people and putting in place supports to help address those are, are absolutely critical. Um, and I would say for working parents um, and organisations that want to do that in a really conscious way, it's actually about embedding those family-friendly practices. So don't just leave them on the intranet as a really good policy, but make sure that you're translating those great policies into practice and that your leaders are really confident and capable to actually translate that so that your people are not relying on what we call the boss lottery, Rob, but that you can be rest assured that you've got that consistency across your workplace because your leaders actually know how to have those conversations. Thanks. That, that leads quite well into a question I want to ask you next, Danielle. The health system can be, as we understand, very complex one to navigate change generally. Um, how can we make sure that the prevention of mental health injuries remains a priority from a systems perspective? So Sarah just spoke there about you know the, the organisational level, so it, they're kind of interrelated. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, absolutely, Rob. Look, I think you, you touched on it, you're right. Health systems are really complex. Um, and when we look at it, we look at a health system actually operates within the broader system as well. So when we get ripples at any point, along the system, you know, it impacts down the line. So certainly psychological safety is getting um, increased attention at the moment, which is really great. And it needs to be considered, you know, as a mandatory field for organisations, not as that optional add-on extra. Um, you know, we've mentioned before that the, you know, the global pandemic has perhaps brought mental health and wellbeing to the forefront of conversations. And we need to see more of that um, in our organisation so that we do see mental health being embedded in, in part of what the, you know, the business is. We certainly are seeing some drivers for change as well. We're seeing those locally and perhaps, you know, nationally and internationally in the term in the um, terms of standards and also codes of practice. There's a really good drivers of change to be able to help um, organisations understand, you know, the importance of having preventative mental health um, systems in place to, you know, to tackle those work related factors, but also to ensure that they can, uh, you know, meet compliance with their work health and safety um, standards. So I think what we need to do with the project going forward too is, you know, making sure what we do is evidence-based for, for our particular projects. It's, it's contextualised to the setting, you know, to the health setting that we're working with. And also that the focus we have continues to look at the system. Um, you know, it's much broader than the individual. You know, for our people to thrive, we need to have the right systems in place for them to do that. So I think um, one of the things too is that continuing to be curious about the work-related factors is really important because we, we anticipate an ebb and flow. So being able to amplify those uh, factors that we see is really important at a time um, and it may be something else you know, in the future. So we really need to be able to manage that. Um, you know, our, our health workforce for us are absolute experts. They're our, the people that have the, the you know, practice knowledge, they can contribute wisdom. Um, and they're the ones we need to consult with too about the lived experience professionally through you know a global pandemic so it's crucial that we consult with them engage them when we're going to be looking at change you know the diversity of thought that they can bring is an incredible resource that we can tap into and i think too we need to be thinking about you know the virtual technologies and platforms too that are making it a lot easier for us to connect and being able to share across um, you know different groups so i think that's an important um, opportunity for us to work through as well Thank you for that. Um, one of the words you moved, you mentioned or the expression you used there was evidence-based. What does that mean? So we're looking at the evidence that's out there and combining it with the knowledge we have of our field so that the work we put forward, that the, the I guess the products for trial and implementation, we know um, have been shown to work or there's enough evidence to suggest it's a really good thing for us to try. 
So is it, is it fair then to say that the use of the words collaboration and consultation or consulting with the, the groups, that makes that really, really important to, to take that evidence and then make it work in a workplace from a mental health point of view? Absolutely. So we're combining what we know is out there from, you know, from the, I guess, the desktop research perspective, and then we combine it with the input from the field. And that's what helps to inform sort of the products that we'll be having that we'll take forward um, to trial to absolutely look at, you know, can we prevent mental injury in our workforce by these sort of strategies? And hopefully it will seed more broader um, opportunities for us to try, you know, further strategies. Thanks for that. I believe there is an intro video, um, so we may play the video first. Meet WorkSafe's WorkWell Toolkit, a tailored free online resource helping employers to create mentally healthy workplaces. Sign up and explore your custom dashboard with case studies, videos and other useful resources that you can begin to action straight away with your team. Use a step-by-step -step approach and track each action. Then share the progress with your colleagues. The topics include role clarity, leadership, change management and so many more. Creating a safe and mentally healthy workplace is good for your employees and your business. Discover the WorkWell Toolkit today. So Meryl, welcome back again. Uh, we actually just showed the uh, WorkWell Toolkit video. And where I was going with that is we've spoken a, a lot about uh, the information. Uh, but what I want to get into a bit more about is WorkSafe is investing a lot of resources to support employers who are striving uh, to create mentally healthy uh, workplaces. How can employers access that in this information? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I talked earlier and you've just watched the video on the WorkWell Toolkit and that's our free online tool that's available to all Victorian workplaces. And the toolkit includes a wide range of tools and resources from really reputable and experienced organisations like Beyond Blue, Vic Health, Black Dog Institute and of course WorkSafe. And it has information that's tailored to a sector your sector in terms of your industry and your business size. It also helps down what can be an incredibly complex issue into step-by-step -step actions. And these can be addressed in a really flexible and practical way by the employer or the business leader. Uh, inside the toolkit, you'll find a suite of actions that help address the important work-related factors that uh, we've all touched on today and other really important topics like leadership and workplace culture. And you've watched the video, so you, you've seen now how easy it is to kind of get started and how uh, well set out the information is and accessible it is. So I'd really encourage you to get online and give it a go. So you say there about getting online, give it a go. Where do you go to get it? How do I find it? Yes, so where you'll find it is on the WorkWell website and all you need to do is Google WorkWell Toolkit results that come up. And again, is it fair to say that this has been put together in collaboration? You mentioned a number of organisations in there and I've heard those names mm -hmm. repeated both by Sarah and Danielle as well, that this is where you're tying mm -hmm. all the evidence-based material together with the consultation, with the collaboration with all these other areas to, to develop this toolkit that, as you said, is flexible. Absolutely. So the toolkit's been developed in a way uh, where we've included a lot of desktop research. We've found the best practice information that's already out there and we've kind of brought it into uh, the one place. We've done a lot of stakeholder engagement with people that are involved in workplace mental health and different industry experts. And we've kind of just drawn all of that information into the one place where it's just easily accessible um, and it's kind of an intuitive way of guiding you through the information. Thank you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of you to just wrap up. What's the takeout for today? What's your key summary or message you want to give uh, to the audience today? So I'll start with yourself, Sarah. I think for me, Rob, it just gets back to the basics. To take time to recharge uh, is just is so important. You know, we've got to have fuel in our tanks. And the other thing I would just say, Rob, is just to remind people of the great resources that are available through the WorkWell Toolkit that Meryl's spoken about. But specifically, if you're interested in supporting your working parents, then the Perinatal Workplace Wellbeing Program that we've spoken about today has a range of resources. Some of those also are really specific to COVID. So how can we support our people working from home with others? and how can we um, support new and expected parents as well. So some great free resources for people to be able to tap into to support their people at this time. Thanks. Meryl, there's the WorkWell Toolkit that you can find on the website. Register an account and have a look around and start taking some actions today. Uh, and definitely also visit the Creating a Mentally Healthy Workplace resource page on the WorkWell website where you'll find more information about those work-related factors we've been speaking about today. 
And if you're also interested to learn more about the individual pro projects, including the ones Danielle and Sarah are working on uh, for the Mental Health Improvement Fund, you can go to workwell.vic.gov.au slash fund and find more details about those projects and some of the great resources that they're producing as well. But there's also, you can apply for the Workwell Improvement Fund, is that correct? You can find information about the Workwell Improvement Fund projects on the Workwell website. No worries, thank you. Now, Danielle, what's your, what's your key takeout for today? As we move forward with change, it's inevitable as we you know, move through times like this that we do take care of ourselves um, and we do take the time to reach out when we need it. So from an organisational perspective, certainly looking at those resources, but also from the individual perspective that we do reach out um, when we need to and access the supports that are out there. Thank you very much for joining me today on those ones. I'll just I'll quickly summarise what, what I think I've heard today. And part of that is COVID-19 and, and the state's restrictions about how we work are, are presenting new and in many cases confounding risk to mental health for all workers. Uh, but in some workforces, such as the frontline worker, or as Sarah mentioned, the workers of the perinatal period are um, already at an elevated level of uh, injury from mental health under normal circumstances. So I think what I'm hearing there is with the claims rate potentially going from the 14 to 33% in 10 years time, having a, a mentally healthy workplace is so important. And what having a mentally healthy workplace is where you have measures in place to prevent harm or identify risk to mental health, um, where it manages harm that does occur, uh, manage it from an early stage and supports recovery. So, you know, in many ways, prevention uh, is is better and more cost effective than the cure. So for an employer, what that means is um, they must provide and maintain a, a working environment that is uh, safe and without risk to health. Um, in this particular case, specifically psychological health. Um, I think based on the conversation I've had with the three of you today, if, if your experiences and the work that's happening with the 25, I believe, organizations is anything to go by, I think we're going in the right direction and we're in really, really good hands. So uh, thank you very, very much for joining me on that one today. So uh, that brings it to a conclusion. Uh, I'll just finish off on a few housekeeping matters again. So shortly, uh, you will get on screen a list of all the resources and contacts that we mentioned today. If you want more information, uh, I'd encourage you to contact WorkSafe through the advisory line to, to get further information. So on that note, on behalf of my three uh, guest speakers, uh, and on behalf of WorkSafe and myself, thank you very much for tuning in today.